I'd like to give a big shout out to all of the parents, all of the uncles and aunts, big brothers and big sisters. Shout out to you all. Shout out to all of the people who've accepted the responsibility and stepped up to the plate to help guide our children into the future. But most importantly, shout out to all of the parents without voices who need to be heard. Hear me. I'm the father of a very observant and receptive 13-year-old boy. His name is Mace, and we've never actually met in person. My son was a little over a month old when I got arrested. When I was convicted at trial, I lost contact with everyone that mattered. I was in a deep, dark place for the first eight years of a 20-year sentence, and I was searching everywhere else for the light that dwells so deep within. But it was in there, and I found it. Yep, I found me. And now I'm in a place where I can enlighten. So my son is already eight years old when we had our first conversation. And I got to admit, I was way more nervous than he was. It had to be excitement, nervousness, shame, guilt, and anxiety all balled into one. See, I've experienced a lot of things, and I've done a lot of reading. And now I have so much to tell him, but I don't want to bombard him with all of the things that I've been holding inside. So I decided that I need to get to know him first, and that I want to talk about the things that he want to talk about. So I finally get the chance to talk to him, and it went nothing like I thought it would. I called his mom and we went through the pleasantries and talked for a few minutes and then she called him to the phone. And he said, hello? I said, what's up, Mace? Do you know who this is? He said, yeah, this is my dad. I said, yes, son, it's your dad. How are you? He said, I'm good, but I miss you and I love you, dad. Now I'm thinking to myself, wow. I felt so happy and grateful at that moment. I was happy that my son knew who I was and some things about me. I was definitely grateful to his mom for taking the time out to make that possible. That was the first time I told my son I love him. And now I do so every chance that I get. But I have to explain to him why. So I tell him, son, my dad never told me that he loved me. Yeah, he showed it by providing quality time and material things, but he never actually gave me a hug and told me that he loved me. And as an adult, I now realize that we were emotionally disconnected because of it. So I may get a little crazy and tell you that I love you two, three times in one conversation. That's just because I missed out on that. I don't want you to miss out on anything. Do you understand that? He said, yes, I understand. It's okay. It's because you miss me so much. So we've been getting to know one another over the phone. And even though I'm not there physically, I can help guide him mentally and build a connection. That's why I strive to prepare for our conversations by having topics for us to focus on when we talk. And as I've come to learn, it never goes as planned. This call happens to take place in February. It's Black History Month. I said, hello? He said, hey, Dad, what's up? I said, peace. Everything is up. What's new since we last spoke? How was school? He said, good. I said, it's Black History Month. What are y'all doing in school for that? He said, oh, yeah. We all had to pick a name of a famous black person and write an essay about them. I said, that's cool, okay. So who did you get? He said, Dad, I got Jesse Jackson. So now I'm thinking, Jesse Jackson, all right. I'm mentally going through my Jesse Jackson files. Civil rights activist. NAACP. First black man to run for the president of the United States. Okay. The Rainbow Coalition. All right, I'm ready. So I asked him, what do you know about Jesse Jackson? 
And he said, that's Michael Jackson's brother. <laughs> I, could, you, could you believe it? I'm like, do, but do you even know who Michael Jackson is? He said, yeah, Jesse Jackson's brother. <laughs> you know I got a laugh out of that, but I had to focus up, so I asked him, where did you hear that? And he told me he got it up on Wikipedia. So I had to bring him up to speed on Jesse Jackson and who he is. And he ended up doing a pretty good essay that month. But then it's on to the next thing. Soccer, soccer was different. It started like any other activity or topic we've discussed. But the next thing I know, all he want to do and talk about is soccer. He actually knew a lot about it. So Christmas come around, he wants a new soccer ball, shin guards, and a pair of cleats to match his team uniform. So I'm asking him questions about soccer just to get him to talk. And like I said, he actually knew a lot about it, definitely more than I did. He's telling me the player stats, the names of different teams. This is going on for a few months. Our conversations are filled with FIFA, the World Cup, Neymar, Cristiano Ronaldo, strikers, hat tricks, different matches on YouTube. He even convinced his mom to let him get a mohawk so he can be an elite striker for his team. So if you know me, I'm thinking he's, it'd be best if he knew as much about soccer as possible. So I'm doing all this reading to accumulate these soccer facts to share with him. We're talking and I asked him, Mace, what do you know about the history of soccer? He said, what do you mean? Like the old players? I said, well, yes and no, because I'm also talking about how it started, where and when. He said, oh, I don't know any of that. So now I need a crash course in everything soccer. We end our call, I love you, son. Talk to you later, I love you too, dad, bye, click. Now I need soccer info. So I'm on the hunt. I get back to the block, I make my announcement. Does anyone have any information about soccer? I'm accepting magazines, almanacs, encyclopedia, books of all kinds. I head straight over to the soccer players, we picked the perfect book. It has the history and everything. So now I'm going in. Our next conversation, I'm telling about the first soccer league founded in 1888 in England the dimensions of the field, which is 328 feet long or 230 feet wide. The first black soccer player, Arthur Wharton. He, he was born in England in 1889. He played for Rotherham United. But May said, Dad, I don't want to be a soccer player anymore. <laughs> so now it's on to the next. He, so now he wants to learn to draw. So we start to talk about art. You know me, I'm thinking, you know, my pops was pretty good with the pen and pencil. Me, I'm halfway decent, but who knows? Mace, he could be the next John michel Basquiat or Picasso. And who am I to deny him that? And remember, I don't want him to miss out on anything. But sometimes our conversations aren't always that consistent. We could be discussing art and the differences between paint colors and shades. I'm sending him drawings and outlines of superheroes and ninjas, some of the personal sketches that I've done, but then we may not talk for a few weeks. And when I finally do catch up with him to continue and see what it is that he's learned, something else has caught his attention. Then I have to adapt and respond accordingly. It can be difficult at times because we have to compete with so many other things to gain their attention. I found out a lot that he just pauses the game or YouTube video when he's talking to me. He never turns it off, he just pauses it. I don't say anything to him about it, but I take note of it. I log it in mentally because these are some of the things that I'm up against. I'll never forget our first conversation about girls. And as always, it went nothing like I expected. I asked him, Mace, do you have a girlfriend? He said, yeah. Now, mind you, he's like nine years old at the time. 
So I'm thinking, you know, puppy love, passing notes in class and stuff like that. But I found out through asking them these questions that they had already been together for two years. <laughs> I was definitely surprised. <laughs> they go to the same school, but they communicate mostly through FaceTime, texting, YouTube, and PS5 multiplayer video games. She lives in Manhattan and Mace lives in the Bronx. So now I'm thinking, a nine-year-old in a long-distance relationship for two whole years. How is that possible? So I asked him. I said, Mace, this girl held your attention for two years? How did y'all manage that? He said, I don't know. We used to hang out a lot at recess. She was my friend. But I said, Mace, you were seven years old two years ago. He said, yeah, dad, and she was eight. She was my friend. It just seemed so simple to him, so I just decided to let her go. I said, okay, son, that's cool. You did good, and I respect that. He said, all right, all right, uh, okay, all right, dad, bye. I gotta go. I'm like, hold on, you ready to go? He said, yes. We have less than a minute left. And I asked him, you know, how did you, and how do you know that? He said, mom showed me how to time the calls when we talk so we don't get cut off. I said, well, that makes sense. All right, son, I love you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Later, dad. Click. Once again, I was prepared, but unprepared. I'm guessing that's the beauty of it, because no matter how prepared we may think we are, we'll always find ourselves altering the script. That's word. Being a parent is being involved. We may not always know how to help, but as long as we're involved, we'll see that the help is needed. And me and my son both needed it. Listen up. In between our conversations, I'll write once, sometimes twice a week. He always say you're gonna write back, but that never happens. That's okay though, because I was doing this for the both of us. And I wanted him to get to know me as a person and see that his dad is a good man. So it's no more scripts this time. I'm just going with the flow. I write short stories, send him little notes, send him, send him some designs of sneakers and shoes that I've done with a note attached asking his opinion. He said he liked rap music. I sent him a few songs I wrote during the COVID lockdown. I even sent him a business plan. He never read it. That's cool. I just wanted him to see what it is that I was interested in. You see, in the beginning, it was all about his interests, and I left mine out. But once I added the things that I like to do, it was amazing. And it caused my son to ask me the most inspiring and reassuring question that I've ever been asked by anyone. Here's how it went. Hello? Hey, Dad, what's up? Everything is up. What do you think about the last sketch I sent you? You think they look good on our feet? He said, yeah, but can I ask you a question, Dad? I said, yeah, sure, what's up? He said, uh, are you famous? And I said, am I famous? What, what do you mean, am I famous? He said, Dad, you do everything. You write stories, you draw, you design clothes, you write music, you be sending me all this stuff, so I just thought, and I'm like, hold on, son. I'm not famous. I was doing all these things to connect with you, but you switch your focus so fast. I'm just trying to keep up and gain your attention. I also do these things because I would like to be successful. And if you ask me, I'll choose for success over fame any day. But then I had to explain the difference between the two and why I choose success. That right there is when I felt like the greatest dad in the world. It's not because my son thought I was famous. Nah. It's because he saw the potential in me, even though he's never actually seen me. He saw past all of the things I was competing against for his attention. Past the 100 mile distance, the 44 walls, and handcuffs. Past all the social networking sites, the music, the video games, and girls. 
past all of the shame and stereotype that comes with incarceration. He saw past all those things, and he saw me. Peace.